What's happening? I'm Len Davis, a Seattle-based filmmaker, and I'm here in Heartland, Vermont, with my old friend, James Sturm. James, how's it going? Hey, Len, how are you? I'm awesome. It's so sweet to be up here with you. Thank you. So James is a cartoonist who's been working on a variety of new projects that he was showing me last night that are super fresh, and I was interested in them, and then I asked him about just talking about his work and telling me about this new project and this new sort of approach to using comics to talk about social issues. And I was fascinated and I wanted to learn more, but at the same time, it was an opportunity to just know more about your work. I've had your books and gone to some of your readings when you passed through mm -hmm. Seattle and familiar with your work. And it's just a sweet opportunity to sit down in your studio and learn a bit, little bit more about you and your work. Yeah. Sweet. So where are we on the planet to start with? We are in Heartland, Vermont, uh, which is uh, not too far from the New Hampshire border, kind of a dirt road out there. And uh, this room used to be uh, where they would milk the goats. And uh, you can actually see where, where, where the um, wood is, is worn to the, you know, past the paint. That's where the goats would stand and rub their horns against the wall. So uh, this, this was a milking room at one point, and now it's, a, now it's my studio. Nice. And we yeah. met in Seattle probably 25 years-ish ago. Yeah. And that was when you were still living in Seattle. But yeah. then you moved to, uh, there were some stops in between, there but you some, eventually. Several stops in between, yeah. Nice. But then you eventually settled here in Vermont to create a new endeavor. Right. So we moved here around 2001, uh, trying to figure out kind of what the next move might be. Because uh, Rachel uh, family had a place we could stay at. And, uh, and uh, the big idea at that time was to start a cartooning college, and uh, it actually worked. And uh, there is a cartooning college, the Center for Cartoon Studies in downtown White River Junction, and that's been open since 2005. Sweet. Yeah. And since 2005, so we're here in late 2022, so 17 years deep in the cartooning <laughs> that you founded. That's your baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Co-founded, but yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And that was the only one of its kind at the time, or I can't remember uh, it was, if... It was a rare bird. It was an independent cartooning college. It wasn't affiliated with a bigger art and design school. Um, it wasn't just a trade school. You could get an MFA degree. Uh, so, yeah, it was a pretty unique, and still is in a lot of ways, yeah, pretty unique place. Mm -hmm. And what was the original vision? I mean, that was a... What led to the creation of that in your work and your sort of vision? Yeah, so like I'm a kind of an independent uh, cartoonist. Uh, you know, I came out of this kind of more underground auteur alternative comics mode. And, uh, you know, when I would go and promote some of my work, I'd go to all these like small press expos uh, and festivals. And you'd have like this wonderful kind of wave of youthful energy and people in there, you know, that, that were going to art school. Mm -hmm. None of them could major in comics because there just wasn't those opportunities at art schools. This is in the 90s and early 2000s? Yeah, 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 in the 90s and even, uh, yeah, in the 90s. And uh, and you're just like, wow, if there was a, a really awesome cartooning school that these for these students, they'd probably want to go there as opposed to just like working outside of their car, you know, their curriculum and then having to do this stuff and go to these festivals to promote and um, create a community for their work. So, uh, you know, so, so we, we did that. We started the school and, uh, and it really, it really has been quite successful, which is, nice. which is really satisfying. And so almost 20 years in what it's a two year program. Yeah. And people can come for a one year certificate. So the two year program is like, summer workshops there's um yeah there's there, there's all kinds of there's you know there's Got it. for local people you know for for kids on weekends now for the local community so it's a pretty vibrant awesome vibrant place so before we get into talking about the new stuff that we were talking about yesterday yeah. the social issue stuff um, show me some of your previous work or tell me about sort of i know that i've got copies of some of your uh, yeah. graphic novels yeah so i've been um you know, since like the 80s, I guess, I've been really thinking about comics in terms of, um, you know, the long form potential. I, I used to do a comic strip for my college newspaper and love, I mean, I love all the formats of cartooning. Um, but I found for myself, like doing kind of long form stuff that I, I kind of work on for several years and then uh, produce work as a graphic novel. And primarily, um, I was working historic fiction that's kind of changed and 
recent years. But uh, I mean, the first kind of book that kind of put me on the map, I suppose, was this book called The Golem's Mighty Swing, which was about a barnstorming Jewish baseball team in the 1920s. And that came out uh, 2001. Nice. Uh, and I, remember, was, I remember being at the reading yeah. in Ravenna. Right, right. And that, that kind of made a, a, a big splash. And it was, you know, it was part of a wave of cartoonists that were uh, starting to get graphic novels out into like, you know, mainstream bookstores. Because at this time, like, there just wasn't, um, you know, they're just, you go in a, a bookstore, there wasn't a graphic novel section. There was like, there were none, you know, yeah. uh, you know, or, or maybe two, maybe, you know, uh, Mouse and, you know, collection of, collection of like Jules Pfeiffer cartoons and maybe accidentally Dilbert was put on the shelf next to it or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you, you didn't, you didn't see the graphic novels, uh, um, out in the wild like you do today. Uh, and I did a book called Market Day about um, the day in the life of a Jewish rug weaver in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, I don't know when this came out, 2010? Um, somewhere around there. Yep, 2010, that's right. Uh, nice. And then most you know, recently I did a book called Off Season, which is kind of a contemporary story about... Um, about a couple uh, who are separated in the backdrop of the 2000, um, you know, the, 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 the Clinton-Trump uh, presidential race mm -hmm. is the backdrop. So, and that one, do I remember correctly? I remember reading it, but it's it's a Vermont story. Yeah, it takes place, yeah, around 2016 uh, in the Upper Valley, this area that I live in, New Hampshire, Vermont. Uh, so it is a bit of a, um, a Vermont, Vermont New England story, yeah. Nice. And then more recently, if we're transitioning to this, sure. these tell me about what these are and how these are different. How are these your right. per, your personal work? How do they reflect your own arc as well as what are they about and what's the? Yeah, actually, that's a good segue because, like, um, you know, this this was like this book was, uh, you know, 2016, where a lot of people were like, "What the fuck just happened in this country?" You know, we we you know now sitting here in 2022, it's like crystal clear that that we kind of elected a, a, you know, a wannabe uh, fascist tyrant to lead our country. Um, and, you know, I think people were really scratching their heads like, holy shit. And in the off-season book, I was like really just trying to laser focus on like what is happening right now in front of me. And the story takes place in this environment. It's a, it's a, it, it, you know, the politics are a back backdrop of it, but also um, kind of inform everything that's happening in the book as well. But in, 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 you know, I thought to myself, well, what else more can I do just as a citizen, just as like civic minded person? And, you know, I'm not somebody who's, um, you know, I'm not someone who's going to, you know, and, and what can I do that's semi, -effect, you know, a little bit more effective than for myself, you know, like I'm, I'm not good at um, that patient sitting in a lot of meetings or going marching. It's like, so how can I, how can I use my talents as a cartoonist to, um, you know, educate, inform, engage people um, around, you know, the really important um, issues of the day um, and, and, and the things that kind of ensure a civil society, really. So um, I thought, uh, okay, well, democracy seems to be in peril. And uh, <laughs> most, uh, you know, they were doing surveys that, like, most people couldn't even name three the three branches of government. And, um, and, and what is democracy and how does it function? Because when you have somebody who's trying to um, undermine that, uh, you know, you have to know what it is to kind of help preserve it. So um, there was this, uh, a recent graduate at the Center for Cartoon Studies who was a great, a really great cartoonist on, on how to explain complex systems. And I said, hey, I want to work on this book. Do you want to help, you know, help do it, work on it with me? Uh, and he did, and, and in that result in this book called This Is What Democracy Looks Like, a, a graphic guide to governance. And, uh, you know, we worked with social studies teachers. We worked with this great Chicago nonprofit called the Mikva Challenge, uh, who, who, you know, teaches com uh, comics and civics, excuse me, not comics, civics and governance in social studies classes with social studies teachers throughout the country. So they worked with us, um, we created study guides, we went on, on a tour where we gave away the comic and did presentations uh, on all these cities throughout the Midwest. And so was this, who, it, initially you have this vision about using the medium of comics yeah. to 
engage the populace. Yeah. And the audience was a, as broad as possible in terms of well, who the potential readers Well, initially the idea are. is that, right? But then you think, like, you know, you, you're always looking for, like, inflection points. Like, how can this comic be the most um, useful? Uh, and, and who, who you, you do, I think it is helpful to kind of target audiences in a way. And we knew that, you know, this could be used in classrooms. And that's been the case. Like, you know, there's charter schools that offer it. And in the New York public schools, they reprinted parts in their curriculum and... Um, it's been distributed like throughout the entire country, and um, and we make sure that these things are free online so people can download them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we, you know, we sell bundles for educators to use in classrooms. And so, using the comic book format, is there a hero? Is there a story in these, or it's more like just using a textbook approach to uh, using a comic book approach to the same way? Yeah. Well, that's an interesting question. Even though, like, when we think about stories, we think about heroes and villains. And in a way, uh, you know, as odious as someone like Trump is, um, you know, to, to cast all of this as his the villain and once we defeat him, we're, we're, we're good. <laughs> we know that's not the case, right? We know that's like... Um, Our challenge is broader. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, we're, we're talking about systems here. And I think um, we have to understand the systems and not get distracted by, um, you know, these larger than life personalities and make it into this big kind of personal thing. I mean, of course, on some levels it is personal, of course, but um, I think it's important to understand these systems. So what these comics are trying to do is to, um, you know, take these systems um, and, and try to have people understand them. And I think when you understand something very, you know, something's too complex and too opaque, you just throw up your hands and say, whatever, uh, and avoid it altogether. But if you have some kind of traction on it and some understanding and you can wrap your brain around a little bit, I think it does give someone agency and empowerment. So, you know, an example, you know, so like, okay, democracy, it's like, how do you explain all the branches of government and local democracy and statewide democracy? And how do you map all that out in, you know, in, in a 32 page comic? And, and, you know, it's challenging. Now, when you say 32 page comic, is that you go into it knowing that's the framework you're working on? Yeah, it's a restraint, which um, and, and it's a really great restraint in a lot of ways, because, um, you know, a comic is, 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 you know, relatively cheap to produce. Um, it's something a cartoonist can work on and not dedicate four or five years to. Right. Um, it is a challenge in most people's attention spans. Like, um, you know, you create anything bigger they might not even look at it and then if you create anything bigger it's like are they going to drop 25 bucks and who's paying for that um and suddenly it's less accessible right so there's a real challenge to make something that's engaging accessible um and somebody can kind of again kind of get into it have a basic understanding of it and you know this isn't um you know a textbook a college class would kind of study over a course of a year but it is something that somebody that's inviting and people will be like, Hey, that's kind of cool. And there'll be some really real takeaways. And then, you know, if you create, which we did uh, lesson plans for teachers to use, um, you know, that allows the comic to be even a more useful resource. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for democracy, complicated stuff, a lot of levels of government, you know, what are the stakes if we don't participate, trying to get all that, um, you know, in, 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 in a way that's really readable. Um, is, is the challenge. So like, so wait with this and then how do you go about deciding? So it's not a, maybe a hero and a villain type of approach yeah. to storytelling, but what goes into determining or what went into, uh, figuring out how you were going to actually tell a story about governance and, and bring that lesson to, to the yeah. comic book who participates in that? Yeah. I think that's a determination that's made by the creative team. That's made by kind of uh, the journalists and the teachers and the experts that we kind of consult when we make the work. Um, you know, I mean, you, when you introduce, uh, you know, some of this, this, this stuff, it's like, you know, what do we, you know, you start with the basic questions and as cartoonists, it's like, we're not experts in these things. And we're kind of like the stand in for the person that doesn't know anything. And we ask all the dumb questions and like, you know, like what is democracy? Well, let's start with the definition, you know, how do we talk about democracy in our culture? You know, is it, is it, you know, we talk about like, a lot of times we use like militaristic terms, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as metaphors. So take um, that. Yeah. I was reading it last night. Let's go to that page real quick and say, how do you take a sort of sure. jargon around militaristic yeah. terms and the way they make their way into 
talking about democracy. Yeah, so it's like, you know, we mostly talk about democracy as elections using jumbled metaphors like a presidential race, um, you know, running on issues, front runner, uh, pulling ahead in, um, in the polls. We talk about it like a boxing match, you know, points scored, gloves are coming off, and then even as an actual war, you know, battleground states, um, opposing camps, um, barrage of attack ads. Uh, but by focusing so much on elections, we ignore how our democracy is set up, how the Constitution divides power between the three branches of government mm -hmm. and the people, um, making government harder to engage with and even more difficult to change. So, you know, this, con like this, this these pages were written and drawn by a great cartoonist, Dan Knott, and, you know, he's really kind of, um, kind of easing us into this conversation. So we kind of start getting, you know, this is familiar stuff. And then we start getting, you know, we, how we think of comics is, you know, excuse me, I think of government as this big tangled thing. And, and then we start talking about the federal, state, and local levels. So he's kind of mapping out, you know, how, how we're going to move through the book in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and we start with the executive branch and we kind of break it down. Um, and we have the legislative branch and break that down. And we have the judicial branch and we break that down. Um, and we talk about checks and balances. So we can a comic like each spread is almost like its own little paragraph or chunk of information. Mm -hmm. So these pages could be handouts in a classroom. They could be a poster in a classroom. Um, you know, sharing power, uh, state government, county government. And here we are getting kind of burrowing down to uh, local governments and, um, and then kind of acknowledging um, how it doesn't work <laughs> as, as it was set up. And, and, and what are the challenges uh, that prevent us uh, from being fair and democratic and equality, voter suppression, um, mm -hmm. you know, lack of diversity, divided government. So you, cetera, you, had the, you had the vision in terms of you approach your team or this uh, illustrator or cartoonist? Uh, cartoonist, yeah, yeah. Cartoonist, when did you produce that? Uh, I don't know, it came, out, it came out like 2000, I want to say 18. Okay. So what are your sort of reflecting on your initial ideas about what role that would play and going through the production process and now four years deep in it, when you look back on how it has or hasn't, how's it been used? Has it been an effective tool? Yeah. What kind of feedback do you get about using? Well, we've gotten great feedback and, and, and you know, with a lot of these things, like, you know, you don't sit down and make a four year, at least I don't make a four or five year business plan about all this stuff. It's like, you know, you're trying to meet the moment you're trying to be a conscientious kind of citizen. I have a certain amount of resources as the director of this cartoon school and this network of cartoonists who are, you know, so creative and talented and, and socially conscious. And you're just trying to, you know, even if you're moving at like a millimeter, you're trying to move the needle, right? Uh, towards a more civil, equitable society. And, and, you know, we're doing it, you know, cartooning is just like this really magical medium to engage and educate people. So we're, um, you know, leaning into that. And, um, you know, so we come out with a democracy comic and then we get a call from somebody who saw it and they're like, hey, we represent a county health board in Ohio, Stark County. And we want to, uh, can you do like a, what you did for democracy about mental health? And, you know, we, we can, you know, let's talk. So, you know, it just so happens there was a fellow that, 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 that was uh, at the Center for Cartoon Studies for like a month working on a book about teenagers and mental health. Um, and I was like, oh, wow, you know, Caribbean would be perfect to do a comic like that, working on a graphic novel about that very subject. Nice. And I said, Cara, could, could you do a 24, you know, do, do a 24 page comic uh, about mental health? Uh, you, know, you think you could fit that in? And she was like, yes, I can. And, you know, then fast forward, like one of these comics, um, Let's Talk About It, A Graphic Guide to Mental Health, is being distributed to every middle and high school student in Stark County, Ohio. And then, you know, then somebody else sees it in uh, King County in, in Washington State. And, and mm -hmm. you know, suddenly that school district is ordering a, a bunch of them. And then, you know, both of them are like, oh, man, it'd be great if you had a Spanish edition. So you know, we figured out how to produce a Spanish edition. And, you know, one of the Center for Cartoon Studies students uh, is bilingual and her father was a, you know, had done some translation. So like she was able to like kind of step in and help us do the translation. Um, 
and, uh, and, you know, and so on and so on. So, like I said, like, comics is a great way. I mean, you're literally breaking things down into little boxes to help understand complex subject matters. Uh, you know, this book, uh, Health and Wealth, it's like, okay, democracy, really intense subject, mental health, very fraught. What, what's the next challenge? And, of course, like the U.S. healthcare system and healthcare affects, like, every single American. It's such a dumpster fire, so complex. And, you know, so I, I decided I, this is a comic I wanted to make to help me understand it and help others understand it. So I spent a year, you know, researching and writing this with, with collaborators. Uh, and, um, you know, then we did this comic book, Health and Wealth. Uh, another organization contacted us about doing something about literacy, who are expert, national experts in literacy and helping educators teach people how to read. Um, so we did a How We Read book, um, and I try to find, you know, cartoonists who were uh, amazing cartoonists uh, to kind of work on these books. And um, it's, it's been really interesting, you know, kind of building those coalitions, those partnerships. Um, it's really different than, you know, like, you know, creating my own graphic novels. It's like a different type of experience, mm -hmm. you know, um, way more collaborative with the graphic guides. So with the success of sort of taking the medium of cartooning to these social issues and producing these pieces, what are some of the, what's on the horizon? What are some of the other issues that you've discussed or thought about continuing on the path of using that medium to, you know, do yeah. civics lessons and reach, you know, as you had stated about your, the general, the larger goals about, you know, about societal change? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of like, um, you know, a lot of, there's, like, there's no shortage of, um, sadly, there's no shortage of social ills or complex systems that need kind of um, unpacking and understanding. Uh, right now, we're working with the state, the Secretary of State of Vermont and Vermont Humanities to produce like a kind of a, a democracy comic that's Vermont-centered about uh, governance and civic life in, in Vermont called Freedom and Unity, which is um, you know, named after the state motto. Uh, we're in the early stages of uh, working uh, with a couple organizations uh, about a mass incarceration. Uh, we'd like to do a climate change book that helps kind of explain that stuff. And, you know, a lot of these things is just getting the right talent, getting funding um, in order to kind of do this work. And, uh, you know, so we've been doing, you know, since like, what, 2019, when we've already done like, well, for five comics done by the end of this year and one of them being translated. So I guess that's a sixth. Um, and, uh, you know, we'd like to be able to, um, do more of this kind of work, but you know, it's, it's uh, you know, making the comic is just like one part, right? Like you, you also have to figure out, you know, you have to bring all the stakeholders together. You have to, uh, figure out kind of like the ecosystem that it's going to kind of move in. Like it's just, once it's produced. Yeah. Because in, 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 in like, where can, where, where can it be deployed and used where it's going to have, um, you know, have the biggest impact and you want to figure that out, like kind of almost as you're working on it, as you set out to work on it. And, uh, and that's, that, that all, that all takes time. You want to you know, get them distributed in comic book stores throughout the country. You want to make sure organizations are using them, um, and, and they have other resources to help them use it. And uh, so, so these are, you know, the comic is just like one part of that kind of campaign in a way. And, and what the comic really does is it gets people excited, right? Like people like comics and they're like, oh, you're making a comic. Well, that sounds like fun. Um, and, and, you know, for people working on the front lines of a lot of the things we're talking about, it can be, um, you know, it, it, it can be challenging work and dreary at times because these are like fraught, intense subject matters. And the comics bring a little bit of a creativity um, and it creates, you know, literally a space to have these conversations with people, um, interdisciplinary, um, you know, inter interdisciplinary scholars and journalists, um, all kind of coming together to kind of explore these, these, these issues. Um, and, and you're making, you know, you're kind of, yeah, making like a little strategic plan. And are you able, given the polarity with so many of these issues and the sort of opposition, are you able with these pieces to sort of take a more neutral approach by way, meaning with this medium as the way of mm. uh, presenting it? Are you able to reach a broader audience than 
a more straightforward guide that doesn't use cartooning as the medium that may become more you know one-sided or somehow reaches a more limited audience as a result of the perspective yeah i mean like they're definitely very accessible just because of the medium and how inviting they are um and a lot of times they're drawn really playfully and um so they're they're you know even if you're talking about something like healthcare, you know, and you look at it and it feels like a children's book. It's like, oh, this looks like fun. And it's like, whoa, you know, but, uh, well, let's right there. Last yeah. night I was looking at it. Can you open the healthcare one? And I was asking you about the, oh, uh, actually oh. it was about the, uh, uh the healthcare one, the, uh, I, right. I was at about mental health. Yeah. I was asking you, can you explain to me from a cartooning perspective, why you choose to draw the characters as with, rabbits? Yeah. So yeah. all the different characters have these ears that somehow take them out of the human realm. Yeah, but I think for kids who are, in, you know, children and, uh, you know, they, it's just a little something maybe, you know, people um, have more empathy often towards animals. They relate more to animals. It's something a little bit out of remove. So from, from not like right on target to yourself. So you can kind of, um, I don't know, um, have a little bit of a distance and from it and at the same time feel more empathy towards it. Um, you know, it's like Aesop's fables, right? Like, like animal stories, they use animals as stand-ins for humans. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think it, it works that way, um, as well. Uh, and it, and it kind of creates, you know, it's something that's really fraught and intense. It, it becomes a little silly and fun. Mm -hmm. Um, even though the information might be the same, um, it, it kind of, um, you know, just, it, it's more inviting. It, it literally tries to you know, create a physical space to talk about, you know, mental health and, 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 you know, how, how do you promote your own? If, if a friend is struggling, how do you reach out to them? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it goes, you know, the brain science behind it. Um, you know, there's a lot of stigma mm -hmm. that, that, um, goes with mental health issues and kind of recognizing those stigmas, um, and how they are, exacerbate that problem so you know kind of unpacks a lot of a lot of stuff and you also mentioned it sort of takes race out of the or somehow was another piece of it when you have a blue person <laughs> or something can you speak to that part yeah i mean in all these books i think we do reckon, recognize uh the racial aspect of it and how that creates greater disparities and um so it doesn't necessarily take it out of it but it does um you know, not every character is a stand-in for some for some specific racial identity, so to speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, great. So this here, where we are in your studio, this is where you do a lot of your work, or are you based out of the uh, out of White River Junction? Uh, I work. I have an office in White River Junction at the Cartoon School, where I do a bunch of the work. Uh, here, I do a lot of more, more of my personal work. Um, but also, you know, during the pandemic, um, I, I was holed up here quite a bit mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And how did that inform or limit or broaden your, your work as a cartoonist? Um, I liked it. I mean, it, it's like that kind of isolation and, and holding up. I mean, that's kind of like the cartoonist default setting. So, um, you know, not leaving the house, I, I, you know, instead of feeling kind of a little guilty about it, I felt virtuous. Like I'm saving lives. I'm saying put, you know, so, um, in, you know, long walks in the countryside with the dog is really good for, um, getting grounded and, and chewing through ideas and just kind of, um, yeah, it was, it was actually, it was, it was nice. It was nice. actually nice. I was, I was fortunate. So if people were interested in learning more about the work and the process, if they had yeah. issues that they were interested in collaborating on or hiring cartoonists to maybe communicate, yeah. you know, complex ideas in their own yeah. systems or whatever it may be, how would people learn more or contact you and your team who um, are working on this? Just go through, just go to the, the Center for Cartoon Studies website um, and you can, you can noodle around there and find contact information, more information about the graphic guides. Um, and that's, uh, you know, cartoonstudies.org. Nice. Uh, pretty easy to find. Cartoon School, Vermont, Google, and you'll, it'll, it'll come up. Cool. Or any of the titles of these books have a website too. Are there any, as we sit in your workspace, in your studio, I see some of these, uh, old panels from, you know, uh, from cartoons. Are there any pieces of anything in your studio that are of specific significance to you that you love, that you'd love to share tools that you use something uh, that all of it, all of it, all every, all these pages. I mean, um, 
I don't know, there's one, this is a piece that was very, that I was able to uh, purchase from the artist, this cartoonist, Mark Allen Stamity, and this was a strip uh, that uh, ran in the uh, Village Voice. And uh, I don't know, when I was early 80s, I discovered McDoodle Street, a collection of it on a remainder table. And it was a, kind of a comics, a weekly comic strip that kind of opened my eyes to the potential of cartooning. And over the years, I... Uh, what was it about that that was so powerful for you? It just, you know, I, I came out of high school thinking I had to draw a certain way to be a cartoonist. Like I had a, you know, a, a, the only career open to me was like drawing, you know, for, for writing and drawing for Marvel or DC or something in a superhero way. And I thought, yeah, I'll get there eventually. And the more I drew, the more I realized that it's not the way I draw. So I thought kind of maybe there's not a place for me in comics. And um, I eventually also discovered the underground comics, uh, you, uh, you know, Spiegel and Crumb and et al. But before that, I, I came across this McDougal comic and there was something very folky about it. It was like really personal. It was really quirky. It was really funny. Uh, and it kind of like, I, I could see myself doing that. Like I could see a place for myself in comics and I could imagine drawing something like that and, and there was a kind of seat of the pants quality about it that really was uh you know kind of inviting uh as well so um you know over the years I got to know Mark uh and I'd always say hey you know I'd love to have um I'd love to be able to um you know buy an original and he's you know he's like well I'm hoping they reprint the book someday and I can't sell it ask me next year and literally I would like every year I would like reach out to him and say, hey, what do you think? And he'd be like, whoa, no, I don't know. I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And it was almost like a joke. And I'd be like, Mark, I don't want to bug you every year. And he'd be like, no, no, keep, keep, keep coming at me. And uh, a few years ago, uh, the New York Review of Books, um, who, who is, who, uh, the New York Review of Books is, uh, w w was doing a graphic novel line. And they uh, reached out here. Yeah, this is funny. They reached out to me and they, they said, do you have any old books that you, you know, in comics that are out of print that you think should be in print? that are really great. And I said, oh my God, yes I do. You should reprint McDougal Street. Uh, and uh, they said, oh, that's a good idea. Uh, and they reprinted McDougal Street and, um, and the book got republished. And then when I reached out to Mark, I was like, hey Mark, are you ready to sell uh, an original to me? And he said, oh, absolutely. I have them all, pick one out. I would love to, I would, I would be honored to sell it to you. And nice. uh, we had a good laugh. And he actually came up to the cartoon school to visit. And it was like a really wonderful, um, wonderful memory and moment. How might yeah. you, how might you approach the same situation with you as another young cartoonist approaching you? In, in what sense? Like, like, well, uh, if the tables were turned oh, and you yeah. were the artist well, and one of your young prodigies was saying, oh, I would be certainly honored and, um, you know, be as encouraging as possible for sure. Yeah. Nice. Sweet. Yeah. Any other pieces or tools or things that come to mind that you'd love to share? Um, you know, these are these are uh, drawings from the first Center for Cartoon Studies catalog that the cartoonist Seth, who's like a just one of the most brilliant cartoonists, um, working today, and he did our very first. We collaborated on the very first um, brochure for CCS, and a few years ago, Rachel, my wife, who's an artist, and uh, Seth and Rachel um, traded some work, so. Um, he, he, he sent these pieces over and, uh, and here they are hanging proudly, uh, in my studio. Um, oh yeah, there's all kinds of stuff, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Sweet. So we're here in late August, 2022, where, where James lives in Heartland, Vermont, in his personal studio. White River Junction is about 15 minutes away where the cartoon school is and, uh, where these, the, the school is sort of the base from which these new social issues comics are being produced, yeah? Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Yeah. James, anything else that you'd like to share? Are there any ways in which you feel as a cartoonist, you're, you're, what you, something that you know about the world or that you understand inherently differently based on your work as a cartoonist? Well, I feel like cartooning is a way to understand the world. It's a way to... Um, figure out what you know and process information. And if I wasn't a cartoonist, I'd, I'd, I'd have some serious issues. So, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, the world is always feels like it's hitting you like a fire hose and, um, to be able to sit quietly in a room and, and, and kind of break up 
that input into placing it in little boxes and moving those boxes around and labeling those boxes with text um, really helps me understand um, and process information in a way that, that is very, I find very um, grounding. And I feel by, by, you know, on that journey, whether I'm exploring something about um, my own personal history or, um, you know, about the U.S. healthcare system, you know, there are times where some of the things that I discover is appropriate to share. And those are the comics that I make. And, um, you know, and I hope it kind of, um, you know, maybe sometimes inspires people to, 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 to you know, pick up a, you know, write and draw themselves, and other times you're just kind of, um, you know, just putting something out in the world that says, I was here, I was human, I was trying to figure stuff out, and mm. I just love how comics it is, like, this very personal medium, it's very intimate, and, you know, you can see my handwriting, you can see the little wobble in my line, and it's not kind of um, mediated by a lot of technology, and um, so I'm, I'm really grateful to, like, you know, the... the the newspaper comic strips and Charles Schultz and the people that, you know, that kind of hooked me as a kid and, um, you know, kind of created and fostered this human connection, uh, through this medium. And, um, you know, I'll keep making comics, I'm sure for the rest of my life. Awesome. I feel so similarly about making this interview with you that using this medium is for me a way of making sense of the world and connecting with people and issues yeah. that interest me. Great. Anything else that you'd like to share before we wrap this up? No. Got to go to work. Got to go to work. Yeah. Awesome. Well, again, I'm Len Davis. I'm a Seattle-based filmmaker. I'm here in Heartland, Vermont with my friend and cartoonist James Sturm. And if you like this video, this is one in hundreds across my YouTube channel that are with artists and chefs and people talking about their lives and their ideas about what they do and how they understand the world. So across my channel, you'll find all kinds of videos with people around the world talking about themselves and the work they do. James, so great to be here with you. All right, Lyle. All right, thanks, Until man. Next time. All right, stay fresh.